Hello. In this video, we're going to be learning about angular momentum, which is basically the momentum of rotating objects. So because rotating objects follow the same basic rules as linearly moving objects, rotating objects also have a momentum. So remember, linear momentum, the momentum we're familiar with, is P equals M times V. Momentum equals mass times velocity. Angular momentum will follow the same basic form. The symbol we use for angular momentum is a capital L, L for angle. Remember, I stands for the moment of inertia, which is like the rotational equivalent of mass, and omega is our rotational velocity. And so there's all of our symbols defined. Remember that angular velocity is a vector, therefore angular momentum would be a vector as well. The unit for angular momentum would be kilogram times meter squared per second. So it's kind of like the unit for momentum, except that meter is being squared. Remember that the unit for moment of inertia is kilogram meter squared. So don't forget about that meter squared part of the unit. Just like all of our other angular quantities, counterclockwise is defined to be positive for angular momentum. So if something's rotating clockwise, we need to give it a negative angular momentum. So we can write Newton's second law again for a rotating object. In order to change the momentum of a rotating object, we need a net torque. Remember the symbol tau is used for torque. The linear form of Newton's second law was F equals delta P over delta T. The rotational form will look very similar. Torque equals delta L over delta T. Or torque equals change in angular momentum over time. If we have a system of objects, then that torque represents an external torque, and the change in angular momentum would represent the momentum change of the system. So that might be if we have a collision of some sort where we have outside torques involved, then we would use that form of Newton's second law. So if we have a system that looks like this, where it's rotating slowly, and then we apply a torque in the same direction it's rotating, that's going to cause it to rotate faster. So same basic idea as with torques before. So let's look at a quick conceptual example. Here I've got an object that is rotating clockwise. And the question is, in which of the cases would the, the angular momentum of this object increase? And by increase, I mean increase in size. So I've got three different scenarios, three different places where we could apply a force that may or may not cause a torque on the object. In the first case, the one on the left, that force would cause a torque, but because it would be in the opposite direction as the momentum, that would cause the angular momentum to decrease. So the force on there would exert a counterclockwise torque, which is positive. The angular momentum is negative, so that's going to cause it to slow down. The middle case would cause an increase in angular momentum. Both the angular momentum and the net torque would be negative, since they're both counterclockwise. The last case, the angular momentum will be constant. The torque would be zero because the force is, per is parallel to the moment arm. So that force would not cause a torque, so it would not cause a change in angular momentum. Just like linear momentum, angular momentum is also cons conserved. That means it remains constant. Now the caveat is that there has to be no external, external torques on the system. So if you know that there's no external torques on a system, then the angular momentum of the system will be constant. And again, the fancy word for that is conserved. So one example of conservation of angular momentum at work is a figure skater. You may have noticed that when a figure skater is spinning and they pull their arms closer into their body, they spin faster. 
There's no external torques in this situation, and so the skater's angular momentum will be conserved. And so you would go from a high moment of inertia to a low moment of inertia as she brings her arms closer in, meaning that the angular velocity would increase from a low angular velocity to a high angular velocity. So simply by changing the way mass is distributed, we can change the velocity, rotational velocity, of an object without changing its momentum. That will be kind of analogous to changing the mass of an object moving in a line, which would cause its linear momentum, or excuse me, which would cause its linear momentum to be constant, but make it speed up. So here's another example. Imagine that you have a small boy standing on a merry-go-round, which is rotating at a rate of 10 radians per second. Um, in this particular situation, we're going to say that the moment of inertia of the system, meaning the boy and the merry-go-round together, is 100 kilogram time meters squared. The boy then walks to the edge of the merry-go-round, which is going to cause the moment of inertia to change. It's going to be different because the mass is going to be distributed differently. So there's a couple of questions we want to ask. First of all, does the system rotate faster or slower? And then second of all, what's the new angular velocity? Can we figure that out using conservation of angular momentum? Let's answer the first question first. We know that there is going to be no change in angular momentum, so we can say it's conserved. We can also say that the moment of inertia increases. Farther out the mass is distributed, the higher the moment of inertia is going to be. So since the angular momentum is equal to I omega, I gets bigger, omega has to get smaller. The moment, excuse me, the angular momentum will be constant, the L will be constant. That means that the system is going to rotate slower. Just by walking to the edge of the merry-go-round, the boy slows the merry-go-round down. Finding a new angular velocity, we will first figure out how much momentum the system has. So actually substituting in numbers into L equals I omega, 100 times 10, that tells me the system has a thousand kilogram meter square per second momentum, angular momentum. That's going to be conserved, and so we're going to keep L the same. Solving for omega would give me L over I, so my new omega would be a thousand over the new I, the new moment of inertia, which would be 125. Just add the 25 to the 100, which means this merry-go-round and boy are now rotating at 8 radians per second which should make sense because we predicted earlier that the system would slow down because the moment of inertia got bigger. Even things that are not rotating can have angular momentum. And this is where it can get a little bit tricky. So let's consider the following example. Let's consider an object which is just moving forward in a straight line. So something like this. If you just look at that, you can easily tell it would have linear momentum. It's got a mass and it's got a velocity. But the question is, does it have angular momentum? Well, if you just looked at that picture and kind of thought about what we've learned so far, you would probably say that that object would not have any angular momentum. It doesn't have a moment of inertia. It's not rotating. But consider this. Suppose that there was a meter stick that was hanging in front of that object that it was about to strike. So maybe the, the picture would now look like this. We have a meter stick going upright, and it's pivoted at the bottom. So something's holding it in place so it can rotate at the bottom. When the picture looks like this, you would say that when that mass, that object, collides with the meter stick, it could cause it to rotate. That means that there must be some sort of angular momentum for this object. Now, we have to realize that that angular momentum is only going to be relative 
to that pivot. If that meter stick wasn't there and it wasn't pivoted at that spot, then we really wouldn't care whether or not this object has angular momentum. So it's all relative, in other words. So, non-rotating objects can have an angular momentum that's relative to a specific axis if it's moving perpendicular to the moment arm. Remember, we give that the symbol R. So let's kind of draw a picture of that. Actually, let's write some equations first. The angular momentum would be R, the moment arm, times the linear momentum. Or you could rewrite that like L equals MVR, and then put little perpendicular signs there on the P or the V to remind you that the M, not the M, the momentum and the velocity have to be perpendicular to the moment arm in order for there to be an angular momentum. Now let's draw a picture. Here's our object again. It's moving to the right, so it's got a linear momentum. If this point down here represented a possible axis, a rotation, or pivot point, then this distance right here would represent the moment arm. That path right there would represent the velocity as the object moves forward. And so we can say that the velocity is perpendicular to the moment arm, so this object definitely has angular momentum relative to this axis. If we choose a different axis, like maybe over here, here the velocity is parallel to the moment arm, or you can consider the moment arm to be zero, either way you'd like to think about it, it's pointed right at the axis, therefore it has no angular momentum. So the angular momentum of something that's not rotating is relative to the axis that we pick, or that we care about. An example of this kind of momentum at work is the motion of the planets. The planets have angular mo momentum relative to the sun. So we kind of draw the sun, we kind of draw a planet, for instance Venus, because it's purple. Venus would have some distance to the sun, we could call that a moment arm, R, and some velocity, V. Now the path of Venus isn't necessarily circular. Most of the planets move in more of an elliptical orbit like this one right here. Now there's no outside torques involved, and so the angular momentum of the planet and sun system would be conserved. So when Venus is closer and R gets smaller, it's going to be going faster. In order for the quantity mv times r, to be constant. And so as the planets get closer to the sun, they're going to speed up in order for angular momentum to be conserved. That's the end of this video. We will definitely do lots more examples and practice in class um, so that we can get better at this idea. But hopefully we have a good beginning understanding of what angular momentum is, why it might be important, and how we go about finding it.